Hello, hello, nonprofit friends, family, frenemies. I don't know who is out there listening to this today. Welcome to another Tame Your Tech live stream. I do these every Friday afternoon at 12.30 Eastern time. My name is Maureen. I'm a nonprofit digital strategist and technology coach, and I love to have conversations about nonprofit technology and strategy and fundraising and data. It's weird, but I like all of it. I think we live in a very complicated world, just continuing to get more complex. And it's nice to have a place that you can come to once a week and kind of talk without jargon and maybe learn some things that will help you do a better job at your job, no matter what that is at a, at a nonprofit organization. And I am so psyched. You are my first guest of 2022. Olga Manishki Waltman from Lemon Skies is here. And we're going to talk about storytelling today for the next 20 minutes or so. Olga, I hello. I want to warmly welcome you. Would you say hi and kind of give our audience a little bit of your background? It's really a rich background that brings you to this industry. Hi, Maureen. Thank you for having me. Um, am I echoing there a little bit? No, you sound great. Okay. Thank you for having me on. Um, so my background is entirely in nonprofit sector. Um, didn't set out to go in that direction, but somehow one thing leads to another. Um, and have focused in my career on communications, marketing, fundraising, um, all non-mission aspects of nonprofits. So um, and, you know, spent time at Special Olympics, American Diabetes, worked with a number of health education type of organizations um, and then started Lemon Skies about three years ago. Uh, we work with clients um, a lot around messaging and storytelling, which is what we're discussing today. Uh, we do a lot of um, content development, whether it's fundraising appeals, impact reports, any of those types of uh, your bread and butter um, campaign materials and planning uh, strategy, um, strategy for end of year giving, et cetera. So that's what we do. And but storytelling is definitely my favorite. Uh, the creative person in me relishes it. So thank you for having me. Your your LinkedIn feed. If you're not following Olga, you should. I'll pop her LinkedIn profile link into the comments in a second. Your whole timeline is a story. You tell stories every day. Um, and I think the art of your storytelling from a reader's perspective is it's always unexpected. The things that you're writing about or the, your, your experiences that you're sharing are just not the, not the standard. There's a little special sauce or a little sauciness in how you present yourself on social media. Um, are there things that you won't post on social media? I'm curious because you're kind of like an open book. I see pictures of you at the gym or pictures of you with your family. So um, storytelling for you, everything is game, yeah? Yeah, I mean, pretty much. I mean, honestly, I won't post anything that feels fake to me. Anything that does not feel real, you know, if I'm posting it, it is absolutely true to who I am. Um, mm -hmm. So, you know, really kind of giving away all my secrets here. The, the <laughs> truth is, it's just all the matter of kind of filtering out the external voices and just focusing on what is my story? What is my truth? Uh, what is mm -hmm. it that I want to say? Um, and unexpected. I mean, you know, I, I do hold back because occasionally I go down the rabbit's hole and explore, you know, the royal families of 16th century. And I probably won't post about that. Um, but, you know, so I put a filter on myself a little bit. Uh, but for the most part, you know, I live in a very integrated way. Life and work sort of blend together. So that's probably a reflection that you're seeing in my social feed. Yeah. And I think the direct connection here to our topic is the lived experience. Mm -hmm. And how do you pull the facts together in a way that is taking the time we're living in and a particular nonprofit's audience, their goals and outcomes? Um, it's hard for a nonprofit fundraiser or marketer to pull those things together, to find the ingredients and kind of serve them up 
in the same way. And you and I have both worked with enough nonprofit teams to know that storytelling can be very painful for nonprofit staffers. They either don't know where to gather the information, getting permission if you're telling a real story about real people and you're going to accompany it with real photos, getting all that permission stuff, but also making sure that you know what the call to action needs to be and assembling the story in a, in a fresh way. So one of the first things I want to ask you, Olga, is this isn't new. There's a thousand storytelling courses. I've been to storytelling workshops for multiple days. It's not new. We all kind of have to do it. Why is it so hard for nonprofits to lean into good storytelling or feel confident in their storytelling ability? Yeah, I mean, I was thinking about that topic a lot, and I think it really starts with a purpose. Um, if you tell a story that's really compelling and emotional, but it doesn't and then tie your mission or your organization to, to the impact, it just remains that. It just remains an emotional story, uh, but you've sort of wasted the attention span uh, and the emotional bandwidth of your readers, uh, and you may never get that back again. So you, you really have to be very clear on your purpose in telling the story. Um, you know, the truth is, I don't think everyone is a storyteller. So sometimes mm -hmm. you're, you know, just like not everyone is capable of manipulating data. Um, storytelling mm -hmm. is not something that everyone can do easily, uh, or maybe they can under duress. But, but I think that's uh, that's an element of it, uh, and it's not a skill that uh, we readily recognize as as such uh, because mm -hmm. it's a little bit more, you know, creative and ambiguous, but but not everyone is a born storyteller. Um, so you can certainly develop it, uh, but having that eye and having that creativity um, to, to tell the story, I think is really important. Um, a lot of stories fall short because they lack a voice and they're mm -hmm. written sort of in a very corporate, very buttoned up mm -hmm. way. But um, I read somewhere, do, like, did you read your kids a press release before bedtime or did you read them a story? So, you know, so kind of using that as a filter, like lacking a voice really makes for a very informative and entirely mm -hmm. compelling, uh, uncompelling piece. Um, and then there's a little bit of a Goldilocks situation with mm -hmm. another Lex story. This got very <laughs> meta. <laughs> Just it really is meta. Um, I read a lot of children's books. Um, mm -hmm. But, you know, if you don't give enough detail, the story feels very generic. Yeah. But if you give too much detail, it becomes very tedious and it becomes, and then this happened. It's kind of like being at a party and being cornered by the person who just retells you yeah. in a sequential way and you're nodding kind of like you are now. And you just, you know, you're just uh -huh, uh -huh. strategy. You're sort of uh, <laughs> doing that um, rescue me now. So, you know, not too much detail, but enough detail. So it doesn't feel generic so that there's something for reader listener, viewer to, to kind of uh, really, um, really kind of hang on to. So, uh, and then last but not least, um, conflict and tension is really important. Um, you know, that kind of advances the story. That's what progresses it. Um, you know, there's really not to get down the rabbit's hole of literary theory, but, you know, you need conflict to progress the story forward. And conflict doesn't mean aggressive, but emotional conflict, you know, sort of internal uh, struggles, any of those sorts of things to, to kind of introduce that so that the story actually has peaks and valleys as opposed to just sort of going flat. Mm, I love all that. That's Those are really simple ingredients, but I think they are the difference between like a bowl of soup and an amazing bowl of soup, right? It's like the seasoning and the the flavoring. You said something that has really resonated with me, which is the voice and the tension. I think I'd love to hear you talk a little bit about the difference between an uplifting story that might, I think fundraisers most particularly get very hung up on. If we act like we solved this thing, people aren't going to give us donations. But if we act as though the problem is unsolvable, people will feel like there's no way their donation will help. So how do you guide folks to be in that middle lane of we haven't solved all of it, but we are making good progress in our stories? 
Yeah, so I think there's the whole concept of positive framing and negative framing. Um, you know, there's sort of a, a cartoon that shows uh, a bunny, a little mm -hmm. rabbit bunny rabbit. And, you know, if you give money, this bunny will live on happily ever after. But if you don't, this bunny will die. Mm -hmm. So, you know, and with nonprofits, um, there's slight evidence that negative performs better, but it's mm -hmm. not overwhelming. And in this day and age, we really are looking for hope and we really are looking for something positive. Um, and the idea of my donation makes an impact. So to your point, it's just edging, it's articulating the need quickly pivoting to, but here's what else we need to do. So it's sort of painting the picture of what solution might look like, but then empowering you, the donor, to actually uh, be the problem solver, the kind of the, to stick with our book analogies, knight in shining armor, solving it. Yeah, it's the, the thing that we've all heard a lot, especially recently since the pandemic started, which is put the, the donor needs to be the hero of the story, not your organization. Oh, yes. And so how do you do that? How can a nonprofit writer, content creator, sort of make sure that that supporter is the hero of the story without like literally plotting out the typical story arc in the first rise and then, you know, um, getting all the way to the penultimate solution where they really are the hero. Is there, yeah. are there easy ways to sort of frame stories with the donor in the center? I mean, uh, the search function really does help. Um, I do on occasion, once a piece is written, I look for all uh, I or us and try to rewrite and replace them. I mean, it's super high tech, right? Like, control find and, you know, trying to just go to town. Yeah. Um, but I think some of it before writing, and this is true for storytelling, but across the board, you have to know what you're trying to say. The work happens before the words come on paper. What is the message you're trying to articulate? Once you have that down, um, it's really then going through, through the words and sentences. Uh, but the aspect of keeping it very donor centric and very donor oriented, I mean, that's a, that's a mechanical, it, I mean, that really is sort of, if you have to put a sticky note in front of your screen to remind you of that, then that's what it is. It's really, um, you know, always keeping it at the forefront and then going back and re-editing to make sure that you actually have done it because it's an easy change. Uh, from you will help us, the great organization, accomplish X, Y, and Z. It's an easy change to say your support will accomplish X, Y, and Z. It's just mm -hmm. a slight, um, slight tweak there. Paying attention. Like words matter. Even sixth grade reading level and skimming on a screen, those words really, really they do, do matter. They do. So we're, we're like heading into year three now of a different world, uh, a pandemic and hopefully a post-pandemic world in 2022, what have you seen change about effectiveness of nonprofit storytelling through the pandemic and beyond? Yeah, so I think kind of before getting into nonprofits, there's a real change in how we consume and how much we consume mm. content. I mean, the podcasts have exploded, uh, the, you know, the house parties seem to have a moment, but I I think it fizzled out now, maybe mm -hmm. um, for now. Yeah. For now. Uh, TikTok. So you know, just the the amount of information we're consuming um, has blown up, um, mm -hmm. and you know, we're looking for something that's a little bit of an escape and the distraction. So there, there's that element. Um, you, you know, something that I read, which you know, I I was kind of horrified by this, but the news consumption has declined significantly. Um, and some of it is we're in off election year, so that could be, uh, but some of it is really not wanting to deal with the negative realities. Um, and then the flip side is there's a real hunger for um, impactful stories that are hopeful, that give you a sense of uh, something positive. Um, a lot of corporate sector is looking for stories of impact, you know, kind of trying to really uh, tie themselves to a cause or to a mission. So I think there's a real hunger for that. And then another huge element and trend that cuts across um, all of that is uh, authenticity and just keeping it very real. It's not about the buttoned up, glossy, polished. Mm -hmm. It's about very real, very relatable, come as you are. And I think some of it is we're seeing celebrities in their kitchens singing songs and we're seeing people with 
you know, hair roots showing and their sweatpants. So, yeah. you know, there's that um, realness. So I think that's, uh, that's what people are looking for. Authenticity. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's the word um, of the year. Yeah. And, and also empathy. Can you speak a little bit to, you know, putting your, I guess I'll ask you a different way of asking this question, which is if, if I want to put myself in my reader's shoes or seat, mm-hmm. um, how how would I change a story that I might have told in t- 2019, you know, in the before times in a certain sort of jaunty way, feeling like everybody who's reading this is doing their normal thing yeah. versus today where we are all very stressed out uh, I just met with someone yesterday who said their middle school aged kid had not been in school since I think December 21st or something between COVID and the holidays and the weather. So h- how do we break through when people are kind of overwhelmed and maybe a little detached and numb? Yeah. Um, so I think what you're describing it's really, you know, first delineating between empathy is not the same as sympathy. It's mm-hmm. not about being nice. It's not about, uh, you know, being extra sweet about it. It's about seeing it through the lens and perspective of somebody else. And that, mm-hmm. you know, that's valuable in working with clients. It's valuable in working with subject matter. It's valuable in our personal lives. Um, so, so it's really kind of taking a pause and thinking, what must that person be feeling? What is your friend feeling? having the mm. seventh grader running not good. around. Not good, no. <laughs> and distraction. So, so it's finding like that point of relating to the human experience of somebody else. Um, I, I mean, I used to think, you know, I would cry, right? Like I'm, I get emotional. Like I, mm-hmm. I live with my emotions. So, and that used to feel like a weakness. And then at some point you sort of embrace it and mm-hmm. just let all the feelings flow. So if I'm writing about, uh, for a health organization about cancer survivorship, like it's mm-hmm. going to be a bumpy ride of an afternoon. So it's just kind of preparing yourself for that, but at the same time, letting yourself feel it because mm-hmm. the content will be that much stronger. Um, I think in acting, method acting, where you yeah. really kind of like, immerse mm-hmm. yeah, immerse yourself, you know, gain 40 pounds for the role, whatever the situation may be. Um, and it's kind of similar in a much, you know, much more, condensed way, but it's really kind of letting yourself feel the feels and then letting the content throw from that. Yeah, that comes no matter what the distribution channel is, that real emotion of being moved by something comes through strong, more strongly and loudly. Even if you are skimming, you can kind of tell that somebody had a full Heart when they they wrote this story, and that's what I think I'm hearing you say is you need to have a full heart to tell the story effectively. Yeah, you put a little bit of yourself in it, and it is exhausting, right? Like mentally, it's exhausting when you're working with that kind of content. Mm-hmm. But at the same time, you know the difference when it's a copy and paste job or just sort of formulaic words. It doesn't feel right, yeah. and sometimes you need to sort of switch up who's writing the content. Mm-hmm. Um, because sometimes you need to step away from it, but it's really uh, trying to see it through the lens of what somebody must be, what is their human experience like? And again, not everybody's a storyteller. Like if you're a very pragmatic, cut and dry type of individual, like maybe you're not the best person to tell that story. Yeah, that's that's a whole other live stream (laughs) that we could do. Because I think people automatically, whether it's from their school experience or their own comfort level, either see themselves as a natural storyteller and that's accurate, or they see themselves as a bad storyteller and that's not accurate, or they see themselves as a great storyteller and it's like a bit of a yawn fest um, in real life. So I love the idea of mixing that up and then measuring like doing your performance metrics did this story resonate um would you ever have two people write the same story or craft the same 
content and do maybe an A B test on you know Mary's performed okay, but Bob's you know everybody opened it and we got more donations. So send Bob's version out or we don't, a we don't have time and maybe that introduces competition where it doesn't need to be there. Yeah, I think also it's not really repeatable, right? Like unless it's a story, um, you know, direct mail, you can mm -hmm. use again and again, maybe. But if it's an email or digital communication of some sort, um, unless there's repetition to it, I, I almost don't see the point where mm -hmm. um, I think there's value is in how we frame the message before we mm. write the words. Do we call it which aspect, which element of the story do we really dive in on? Um, because every story has so much to it and there's different ways to focus on it and different ways to angle on it. So which way do you approach it? So, so perfect because I think we overcomplicate the ingredients and we overthink it, we over edit it and just, it turns into a grind a couple times a year that no one looks forward to. It's sort of like your, your annual fiscal year budget planning. It's like, I no, somebody else can do this. You mentioned that we do have stories coming at us through a million different channels these days. How does the channel drive the storytelling or does it, does a good story work no matter how you're putting it out into the world? That's a really good question. So I, I think the good story, the fundamentals of a good story carry across all channels, but the execution will vary because if attention is more fleeting, for example, in social channel, you need to really simplify it. You don't have room for any level of detail. Um, if it's a story that has visual elements, um, you know, you can sort of add the photos or the video footage or the compelling music like Q Sarah McLaughlin, uh, that can really help. Oh, yeah. You, you know, see that you know commercial right now. Right, right. It's almost, you know, that alone can carry the story and it kind of connects with you and makes you emotional. Mm -hmm. If it's a written piece, then you need to use stronger, more evocative words to really kind of connect at the same level. So I think that the basis, sort of what what is the point of the story remains the same, but the execution is where it changes. Are there channels that are just not good for nonprofit storytelling? Well, I think it depends on your audience, mm. right? So if you're targeting your, yeah, I think it entirely depends on, um, on your audience and where they're reachable uh, and also keeping you know, your ex own expectations in check, right. you, know, you may show a video, it doesn't mean they're immediately clicking and giving um, a $200 donation, uh, but those stories over time stick with them. So it's just sort of being consistent and trusting the process. Okay. You just said something so brilliant. Like I, I'm going to, I just have to stop for a second because I think for most nonprofit folks, a good story is the one that raises money. Mm -hmm. It's only a good story if we hit our performance goals. Do you find that that's a, are you able to separate that in your work with clients that this may not raise a lot of money, but it's an important story to share anyway, because, or when you work with clients and others, is your storytelling really geared toward the outcome of the call to action? I think it's more akin to um, how you how you credit donation, right? Like different channels contribute to conversion, but yeah. you know, it's a little bit hard to, uh, to identify what exactly kind of tips it over the edge. Um, I, you know, I think it's a bit, and fundraising, like look, fundraising flows through my bloodstream. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, it's kind of an old school way of thinking of, you know, we fundraisers send fundraising stuff and money comes in and that's it. Fundraising, the stewardship, the storytelling, the mission messaging is a huge part of fundraising. Mm -hmm. It may not be designed to specifically get a conversion right there and then, but telling the story ultimately will increase commitment to your organization and encourage giving. Now, how you measure it, it gets into all sorts of complexities, but I know I've seen studies where the act of thanking a donor uh, increases their mm -hmm. no, no fundraising links, nothing, just a simple thank you. Over time, it actually comes back to you in spades. Yeah. 
So it's, it's a relationship. You're, you're mm-hmm. cultivating a relationship. So it's constantly yeah. reminding why they matter, why their contribution matters, and where the impact comes in. Where I do see some of the storytelling falling flat a little bit, telling a really emotional sob story that doesn't connect to the nonprofit. Mm-hmm. And it's sort of, you know, I feel connected and I feel for the subject of the story, but it doesn't really logically connect. Therefore, I should support this cause. Yeah, I I completely agree. I'm also seeing some nonprofits, some sort of bold nonprofits that are small and they can sort of do what they want and break the rules because they don't even know what the rules right. are, which is lovely. Telling a, a long story and and it's a whole year of sort of reinforcing the same story with different chapters and like, here's a photo and it's contributing to this year long story. Mm-hmm. Is that something that you're seeing too? Or are these just really outlier orgs that I, I've paid attention to recently? So I love the idea of kind of continuity and the story arc and kind of continuation mm-hmm. of it with the assumption that your readers are paying attention to follow the journey. So as long as those individual chapters stand on their own, if I come in midstream, mm-hmm. if I'm still able to understand the purpose and you know, kind of the commitment of it, then sh- certainly. Uh, but if I come in and I have no idea what it is, then right. it's a little bit less. So I like the, I like the premise behind it. It's sort of like the, you know, thousand and one night, you know, sort of yeah. yeah. So I love that in concept. I think in practice of attention spans, that's where it gets a little bit tricky. And maybe it does work. I don't know if it's even working. I'm a recipient of these stories and I've just noticed them. Maybe the, the reason it works is that, that they do have a very small audience. You right. know, it's not like they've got half a million people or more in their email list and people are tuning out 90% of it. And then, as you said, sort of come in halfway through the show and they are at sea. So it's, even if it's a relevant story to them, they're going to feel like they're missing something. Right. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And you have to sort of cater to the lowest denominator in that regard, right? Like um, no matter where you come in, you still have to compel them. What would you share advice wise for folks who are feeling like, I have told all the stories my organization has to tell. They're burned out. They're just like my colleague who has been home with her nine-year-old for way too long. And they just need some kind of new creative inspiration. Where where should people look? Yeah. So, I mean, the, the biggest inspiration, I really think that it comes from unlikely sources. It's not just looking to other nonprofits, but the more content you consume, the more inspiration you draw. And it's not that you're replicating it. It just kind of gets your creative juices flowing. So, you know, I listen to a ton of podcasts. I listen to audiobooks. Mm -hmm. I mean, all of the above. Um, But it's really, you know, the more you consume, the more suddenly the puzzle pieces start falling together. Um, I mean, I think the kind of the being tapped out, the feeling of exhaustion, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think of creativity, it just flows, right? As long as you let it. So it's really just paying attention. Stories mm-hmm. are all around. So it's just really kind of taking note when you hear something that's of interest and kind of starting to pull out that thread. Um, you know, it's probing a little bit, not just sort mm-hmm. of asking the questions of what happened. That's a very surface level. But how mm-hmm. did the subject feel? What was a memorable moment? Mm-hmm. Um what, what are their dreams and hopes and aspirations? So just really kind of thinking of it um, in that way. And, you know, a couple of my colleagues, um, you know, have journalism background. And that's almost like a lost art with so much going digital. And, you know, mm-hmm. frankly, quality of news stories have gone downhill a bit. But it's yep. that journalistic instinct of there might be a story here. So let me pull out the thread. Let me see what's under the surface. And just being curious and excited about it. I think that's really what it's about. And if you're completely burnt out, I mean, you know, probably no amount of tips will solve it. I mean, I think that's when you need to kind of step back and think about what is it that I need to do to get myself into a better place. Yeah, maybe it's um, some other kind of creativity, right? If you 
are a crafty person or, or whatever, you can pursue some other kind of creativity because it all kind of does come from the mm-hmm. same place in, in my experience. As we get cl- close to the end here, I, I'm wondering if you would recommend that a, a mid-sized to large organization actually forms like a story committee, it feels like super corporate story task force, story work group to ask themselves that question collaboratively, is there a story here or what is the story that we're trying to tell? I find that these usually work where it's like one person grinds away at it and then it goes through the editing and revision process and eventually goes out into the world. What do you think about collaborative storytelling? So I delineate between story gathering and storytelling. Mm -hmm. And I think the story gathering piece, that's where I think it's actually very valuable to go as far and broad as you can. Um, you know, hey, I heard this thing, you know, just sort of collecting the the tips and leads that could go down um, that you could explore potentially. But as you and I talked about, not everyone is going to take that story and do it justice. So it's really kind of sourcing um, and getting as much detail as possible and kind of getting the information and then letting your creative um, messaging people really sort of frame it and, you know, sort of figure out how to curate what's not too much detail and what's too much and just really kind of take it and produce something um, that will resonate. And then you alluded to the editing piece. It's not killing the best of the story in the editing process. Mm. Um, Once you start editing by committee, you you know, and it's all with good intentions, but inevitably the voice is lost. So you, you sort of have to, to assign the person in charge of the voice of the story. And it can come from different sources, yep. but you know, once you and I start using different words and different vocabulary and different sentences, um, the the overall s- story starts falling apart. It's jarring when you pick up on different tone or different okay. voice. You know, this is Sarah's paragraph. You okay. know, you can read it. It takes you out of the story, and that's not okay. what you want. You want yeah. to keep people in there as long as possible. Yeah. Olga, we could like do a whole like paid live webinar series on this stuff because people are so hungry to make this as effective and joyful, really, a process for the creators of the story. Um, I know writers struggle with words and framing and phrasing and things like that. And most of the people who do this for nonprofits are not trained. Right. They're kind of making it up and pulling things together. What's your last great tip that you might give folks um, as we start to end our time together today? I think it's the authenticity and realness, uh, letting it come through and pick your people that have natural affinity. Don't try to put the square peg in the round hole, but pick those natural storytellers that just really convey the voice and they can come in different places and just sort of trust them to, to do the job. Maybe the best storyteller in your nonprofit works in your finance office. Maybe. Well, I mean, really. I've never met one, but it could be. <laughs> that was a bad, okay, works in HR yeah. or some, you know, something that's a little more people oriented. No disrespect to our finance people. We love you. We they need sign you. our we're facts. Glad that you're here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. A little more dry. Um, Olga, always such a pleasure. You and I are going to have to set up a time for us to connect offline, yeah. um, not in the public view, and just do a little catch up now that the holidays are behind us. I want to just thank everybody for watching live or recorded. We really appreciate you being here. I wish all of you a wonderful slide into what is hopefully a three day weekend for you mm-hmm. and decompress disconnect, walk away from the technology and the work for at least part of your long weekend if you can. And then I will see you here next Friday at 1230 for a coaching session. So I'm looking forward to seeing everybody here. Olga, thank you so much for joining me. It's just always a pleasure to share your wisdom with folks. Wonderful to see you. Everybody have a great weekend. Thanks again, Olga. Catch you later. Bye. Bye.